Nuts and My Yo-Yo String by Jerry Spinelli. Essential question, why is teamwork important? Writing about his childhood in Norristown, Pennsylvania, author Jerry Spinelli remembers House Avenue, his dentist and all the neighbors, bullies, girlfriends, zip sandwiches and pesky yo-yo string knots that fill his days between Hartranth Elementary and Norristown High and that later filled his books. On Friday evening, October 11, 1957, at Roosevelt Field, site of my 50-yard dash trim five years before, Norristown High School played lawyer Marion in a football game under the lights. Lower Marion was a powerhouse. Over the preceding three years, they had won 32 games in a row, but Norristown was good too. It figured to be a close, fiercely contest game, and it was. I was junior now, 16 years old, and my autumn sport had become soccer, but I still loved football. I was one of thousand in the grandstand. As the teams changed field direction for the start of the fourth quarter, Norriston was lead 7-6. Each team had scored a touchdown, but the aces of Lower Merriam had missed the extra point. But now a Lower Merriam halfback was breaking free and racing downfield. Blue and white shirted Norriston Eagles and pursued. The Eagles stopped him on the one-yard line. And the stage was set for one of the great moments in Norston's scholastic sport history. First down and go to go on the one. One little yard, 36 little inches. Lower Merriam, 32 straight victors. Who could stop them? In the bleachers across the field, the Lower Merriam fans celebrated. Nurstone's fans grinned, awaited the inevitable. The first AC ball carrier plunged ahead, helmet first. The lower Marion side erupted in a touchdown roar. But strangely, no touchdown sign came from the referee. The ball carrier was crumpled in the rude arms of Eagle defender Mike Branca. The ball had advanced nearly an inch. Twice more the aces run the ball, attacking different points in the eagle defense. The results were the same. The sound from the lower Marion side was rising and falling as if directed by a core master. But now as the AC quarterback bent over the center for the fourth time, and barked out the count, Roosevelt Field fell silent. For the fourth time, the AC quarterback handed the ball to a running back. They refused to believe anyone could stop them from ramrodding the ball 36 little inches. And for the fourth time, the ball failed to penetrate the end zone. The impossible had been done. Now it was the Norristown side that erupted with a roar and a celebration that continued through the end of the game and burst from the stadium and spread out across the town and laid into the night. I rolled the tide, Lower Marion. We had beat Lower Marion. I couldn't believe it. At home in my room, I could hear the blurring horns and tricks of victory. Again and again following my old habit, I replayed the miraculous. Eagle go line the fence in my head. I went to sleep re-experiencing the event, refilling the thrill. In the morning I woke up and did dream on 
and began to realize that I had a problem, for no matter how many times I replayed the goal line stand in my head, I kept falling short of satisfaction. The scoreboard had said the game was over, but for me it wasn't. For me it was somehow frustrating and incomplete. I discovered that Roosevelt Field was not the only field that the game had been played on. The other was inside myself. The game kept happening and happening within me. I could not come to the end of it. Analyze the text. Author's purpose. What clues on pages 52 and 53 hint at the author's purpose for writing this selection? Go to go. The score stood 7-6 with but 5 minutes to go. The ace attack employed all tricks to settle down its stubborn foe. It looked as though the game was done when an ace step wide run right. An eagle stopped him on the one and tumult filled the night. 32 had come their way and 32 had died. Would the number 33 this day for one yard be denied? Roy Kent, the eagle mentor, said, I've been waited for this game and now the fans go stop and dead and crash the hall of fame. The first ace butted for the goal, and nothing did he see, but Branca swearing on his soul, you shall not pass by me. The next two plays convinced all, the ref would make the touchdown sign, but when the light shone on the ball, it still lay inches from the line. Said Captain Westwood to his gents, it's up to us to stop this drive. Said the worth every nerve and expense. We'll do as long as we are alive. The halfback drove with all his might. His legs were jet propelled, but when the dust had cleared the fight, the eagle line had held. Alas, for me, the game was over. Analyze the text. Figurative language. What are some examples of figurative language and go to go on pages 54 55? On a September day in 1992, 35 years after Norriston High's historic goal line stand, I stood before an audience of children and adults in Fargo, North Dakota. I was there in connection with my novel. Maniac Mag, which had recently won the Nearberry Medal for Children's Literature, the important award on this day, however, was the Flicker Tale, which had been voted to Maniac Maggie as a favorite of North Dakota's young readers. A hundred elementary school kids sat cross-legged on the floor as I accept the plaque. After giving a little talk, I invited the audience to ask questions. There were many. One of them stays with me still. It came from a boy who said, Do you think being a kid helped you to become a writer? Good questions. After writing Go to Go, I gave it to my father and forgot about it. Several days later, I opened the Times Herald to the sports section and there was my poem printed in a box with the headline, Student Walks Poetic. At school the next day, everyone, kids, teachers, football coaches, told me how much they liked it. That, I believe, it was the beginning. By the time I went off to Gettysburg College two years later, I knew I wanted to be a writer. I graduated from Gettysburg, attended the writing seminars at the Johns Hopkins University, spent six months on active duty with the Naval Air 
Reserve, got a job as a newswear editor for a department store magazine, and in my spare time began to write my first novel. Three years later I finished, but no one wanted to publish it, so I wrote a, another, and another, and another. Wrote them on my lunch hours after work, weekends. Four novels of 13 years. Nobody wanted them. In the meantime, I gained a wife, Ellen, also a writer, and six kids. One day for dinner, we had fried chicken. There were leftovers. I packed the unclaimed pieces into a paper bag and put it in the refrigerator, intending to take it to work for lunch the following day. But when I opened the bag early the next morning, I found only chicken bones. The meat had been eaten away. No doubt this was the work of one of the six little angels sleeping upstairs. Knowing no one would confess, I'm still waiting. I went to work that day lunchless and began to imagine how it might have gone. Had I known who the culprit was and confronted him or her in the kitchen, by noon I had decided to write down my imaginings. I was about to do so, intending to describe the scene from the point of view of the chicken-deprived father, when it suddenly occurred to me that there was a more interesting point of view here namely the kids and so with ballpoint pen and yellow copy paper in a tiny windowless office on the fifth floor of the chilton company in hardlenor pennsylvania i wrote these words one by one my stepfather took the chicken bones out of the bag and laid them on the kitchen table he laid them down real neat, in a row, five of them, two leg bones, two wing bones, one tight bone. And bones is all they were. There were, wasn't a speck of meat on them. Was this really happening? Did my stepfather really drag me out of bed at seven o'clock in the morning on my summer vacation so I could stand in the kitchen in my underpants and stare down at a row of chicken bones. Analyze the text. Point of view. Why do you think Jerry finally decided to tell the chicken bone incident from a different point of view? How does this other point of view make the story more interesting? That night at home, I kept writing. I gave the chicken's nature a name, Jason, and an age, 12, and I started remembering. Remembering when I was 12, when I lived in the West End, when I went to Stuart Junior High School, when I wanted to be a shortstop, when I rode a bike, when I marveled at the nighttime sky, in my head, I replayed moments from my kiddhood. I mixed my memories with imagination to make stories, to make fiction. And when I finished writing, I had a book, my fifth novel, my first about kids. I called it Space Station 7th Grade. It became my first published book. In the years that followed, I continued to write stories about kids and to rummage through the attic of my memories. Nurston became two mills in my fiction. George Street became Oriole. There is a prom in one book and a girlfriend named Judy in another. There is a beautiful blonde who lives on an avenue called Halls and a mysterious man on whose front steps no kids there sit. There is a zip and a mulberry tree, a little league field, a park, a zoo, a band shell, a red hill, and a mother who whistles her kids home to dinner. 
There is a river called Skunkill and a creek called Stony and a grocery store on a corner next to a house whose address is 802 and a brown finger in a white mouth and a boy who is a wizard at untying knots and yo-yo strings. Do you think being a kid helped you to become a writer? I could have taken days to answer the boy's questions, but neither he or nor Fargo had that much time. So I simply nodded and smiled and said, yes, I believe it did. A building ball player, age 4, 1945. Short stops green socks, age 12, 1953.